enterprise agility would be this notion, hey, I got this great idea for our customers. How do we fix our website to enable us to offer the service? So obviously we've got to create the service that's a business capability, but then we need a software enabling of that. So enterprise agility is not how fast can the software be developed, but how fast can I get an idea of a business capability and then get it out on the site. That's what we're talking about. That's what I mean by enterprise agility. Okay. So with enterprise agility in the background, let's go back to these questions. Time to market. Now I'm going to show you something that maybe many of you, some of you have seen before, but it's a very important concept. And it actually, in a lot of ways, is the real reason we do agility in the first place. It's to have incremental business delivery. In other words, we want to, on an incremental basis, deliver things. How you get the business increments is, is another issue. Let's take a look at this. Uh, how can we do this? What are the economics of responsiveness, so to speak? So this comes from Danny Cleland Wang's beautiful book called Software by Numbers. And I'm actually going to give you, in my mind, the real critical part of this book. There's lots of other good stuff in it. But it's their notion of what they call a minimum marketable feature. And to start with that, before I get to what an MMF, minimum marketable feature, is, let's look a little bit at, at the economics of software delivery. Actually, this is true for any product delivery, but I'm gearing this one particularly towards software. So we can see at the start, you know, our, if we measure our cash flow at the start, we're losing cash. I mean, we're investing, we're developing, it costs us money. At some point, we have that first release, so we have this investment period, then we release, we have this payback period. And at some point, hopefully, we'll make money. The, you know, hopefully it keeps making money. So the question is, though, how, what if we can respond quicker? So let's imagine that I'm uh, the head of a company that does uh, software projects for other people, and we get this request for a proposal, and the RFP has uh, four, four basic statements about it. It lists 100 features, you know, one through 100. It says these are the features we need to build. It says you've got 10 months to build it. It's got to be of this quality, and here's how much you're going to pay. And, oh, by the way, you have to stick with these four things. You can't, you can't add more features. You can't take features away. Higher quality, not allowed. Lower quality, not allowed. You know, can't get it sooner to us and we can't take less money or more money. Any, any deviation from these four things will immediate, result in immediate disqualification. We're trying to have a level playing field, say. What can I do? How can I differentiate myself? Well, if I was maybe had the best track record in the industry, I could, I could possibly differentiate myself on the basis of credibility. But let's say that's not a factor. There is one other thing that I could do that doesn't break those rules. Okay, and let's look at that. What if I took the first 50 features and I said, look, here are the first 50 features. Uh, we're going to give those to you in five months. We're not violating the rule because we're going to give you all 100 at 10 months. And if you don't want to do anything with those first 50, you don't have to. But if you take the first 50, what will happen is if, if you notice these two curves, the first one is what happens with the first 50. In, half, in five months, we'll release it. And it's got, it's got some... Uh, you know, return, assuming I can get a return. Now, this isn't always the case. You know, I, if you're writing the flight control system for an airplane, you can't say, well, we'll get it to turn left in five months, so we'll get it to turn right in five months. That doesn't work. But a lot of times, you might have a 10-month project, and you could say, you know, the first half of this stuff, if I get it done, I could release it, and I could make money. So what we're saying is take that first half, assume it has half the value, and release it. Okay? And then take the second half and release it, five months later, so I kept the guideline, I got all 100 features, I got it in 10 months, I kept to the quality, and I'm just kind of showing those two, uh, those two returns for the two halves. But if I add them together, I get something like this. And what's interesting is that this total return is going to be higher than the single release in most situations. All things being equal, if in fact I get half the release, half the value, it'll, it'll, I'll be getting half the value a little bit ahead of time. In other words, I probably should have shown this when I'm back on this slide. You might notice that as the first half is done and I'm getting a return, it's sort of subsidizing the second half. That's why it doesn't go down as far. So when I compare the dip of the first one to the second one, it doesn't go down as far. They can say, well, but what about the cost of two releases? Well, you know, that's right. If the cost of two releases is very, very high, you'll actually get some additional cost for the release and you may not get this. So assuming you can release it and assuming the cost isn't too high, okay, some assumptions, things to consider, but let's think about it the other way. That might make it even more advantageous, not less advantageous. What if your competition is coming out with something and once you have a product out in somebody's hands, they don't want to switch. Product loyalty, time to market is important. 
then notice if I can get it out in my customer's hands five months sooner and then they don't switch, then I might capture the market a lot. So we might actually find that, that this is considerably higher than before if time to market makes any difference. So there are obviously a lot of factors. There's cost of release. There's this, are the customers willing to have two, two updates? Uh, how important is time to market? Are we going to saturate the market? But it's something to consider. Now, the question is, in this case, I kind of picked, you know, I kind of picked the first 50 on the list. That's actually not a, probably not the best way to do it. What, what Denny and Cleland Wang recommend is you look for something that actually makes sense to release, that actually bears the cost of the uh, transaction, you know, the actual delivery cost. And that's not just the developer delivery cost. That's also the customer consumption cost, you know, the support cost, training, things of that nature. A lot of people point to the technical issues, but to be honest, the technical issues are more easily solved. Good design is something that's another part of our business. We do a lot of design patterns and test-driven development and acceptance test-driven development. How to do incremental release from a technical point of view is really not the real problem, or it's a lot of problem for other people, for companies, but it, it's a solved problem if people would look at, at what's known out there. A lot of times people haven't paid attention to it. Anyway, the point is, that you look at the transaction costs, you find that part that can actually be delivered, that actually makes value. And it may not be half. You know, it could be, the, you know, Pareto, the Pareto rule says 80% of the value comes from 20% of the work. So it could be some small piece could actually give you most of the value. And in this made up example, I was like sticking to the 100 features. But in the real world, you can imagine if I get this minimum marketable feature, that part that can actually add value that's worth delivering, I might assess the value of the rest of it. Sometimes I'll have something if I do a, a release of a certain part of a product to get most of my value and then incrementally I don't get as much. This is why it's very important this notion of assigning a project or a group to a product and keeping them there just letting the product owner or customer drive it is silly. You see that second and third release they, it may be it may be worth it to the customer to release that, but that may not be what you want to be doing when you look at it from the business side. Being customer driven is a lot different than business driven. A customer might say, oh yeah, give me this extra bit, give me this extra bit, give me this extra bit, and I'm tied up with a team adding a little bit to this product's value and there might be another product just like this. If I would just do the 20% of the second product, I get this huge return. So we're starting to see the need for product portfolio management so we can balance one product against the other. Of course, they're also not all like this. Sometimes there's some certain amount, you know, might be five, 10 months to get something. And sometimes it actually takes a long time. Now, I, I really actually should say not waterfall. I don't mean why you do this in a waterfall process. You would still, of course, build it incrementally to discover, make sure you're on track. Actually, kind of like that sometimes with the waterfall question mark. Do we have something that could be delivered in say three months and then another release in five months and then like that? But, or do we, do we, because we're using waterfall, do we make it take 10 months? In other words, imagine this scenario. Imagine you've got a product that it's going to take 10 months to build the whole thing. And you decide, well, we're just going to deliver it all in a stage. And if you use the waterfall pro process, you're going to have a ten, one delivery in 10 months. So it could be you've got a project that comes out as one release and then you get the value when, in fact, it could have looked like this. Uh, in the Pareto because it was a lot of value up front. You might want that last bit for other reasons. So does your process preclude you from having delivery in an, incre in an incremental way that would add value quickly? That would be very useful. We want to think of our business value pipeline, like ideas come in, you know, we select, we prioritize, except what we also have to do is not just select and prioritize. Now we realize we got to select and size. In other words, we might have to break down these big chunks of business value, size them so we can give them to the development team and then get feedback both as where our value is. Not just feedback, is it the right product like from the developer's point of view, but is it like the right product like do the customers want? So we might not be sure which would be the best product. We might actually come up with three. Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to build all this one, we might build a little bit of all three of them. Deliver them, see which one's hot, then put our money in the one that's hot. So you all of a sudden, using Agile from the business-driven point of view, can start doing all sorts of things about deciding what's a good product or not. So again, like if you've got, say, uh, projects that are going to take five months each to build, but you can build a little bit in a month, you might release one product partly in a month, another product partly in a month, a third product partly in a month, 
Get a sense of which one's the hot one, then go with that. Okay, there's a lot of flexibility. The team enables it, but what you're really going after is this business flexibility. Thanks for watching this lightning webinar brought to you by Net Objectives. We're committed to equipping our clients with effective business driven software development methods so they can be more successful. Please let us know how we could help you. Visit us at www.netobjectives.com.